If you are visiting with us for the first time, we want to say hello. If you're here for the second, third, or maybe you've come back after a few months, we just want to welcome you back to Harvest. Um, I would just invite you, if you've never filled out one of these, or maybe you have some information to update, perhaps you have a prayer request, or you're looking to um, connect in some way, that, or uh, perhaps a way that we can serve you, please fill this out. You can drop it in one of the boxes or give it to one of our ushers. We would so um, just appreciate that, uh, being able to connect with you in that way. So welcome. Um, a few things that are coming up, an email did go out this morning. So again, if you're not receiving our emails from Harvest Church, be sure to just give us your information on this orange card. Uh, but it had a lot of announcements, so I will keep it brief uh, since it's all contained on the email. But uh, this week we do have a few things coming up. Thank you, by the way, to everybody that came out this week and helped decorate and just bring uh, just some some Christmas spirit here to, uh, to the church. And so thank you for your help and just uh, the hands that toiled with that this week. Um, on Friday, we have a family event coming up, and it's our first gingerbread decorating party competition. <laughs> it's going to be a lot of fun. We're planning for it. It's going to be Friday night. We have two different time slots that you can either bring. Um, you can actually invite your neighbors. This is a cool thing to invite your neighbors to if they have kids. If they don't have kids, just bring them as a group. Um, we have reserved tables that if you sign up for a slot, there's um, either online on the email or online, as well as um, there's a, a sign-up sheet in the back in our foyer. And there you can sign up for a slot. It's either 6.30 or 7.30. We'll provide um, the gingerbread kit. We'll take your photos and allow uh, just some fun competition with that as we decorate and just uh, uh, enjoy a, a word from Abner. He'll be, he's one of our family directors and be sharing that and just encouraging time just to be together and get to know each other. Um, there will be some hot cocoa and cookies and whatnot. So come out to that. Um, that following week on Tuesday, December 13th, we are gathering the ladies. We're doing a sisterhood night out. We haven't done this for a while where we've gone off outside the church. And what we're doing this year is a Christmas progressive dinner. And what that means is we are going to three homes of some women in Hamilton here. I'm going to start out at six o'clock doing appetizers at one woman's home. Uh, we'll be over at Tish at Pomnitz's house. And then we'll be going over to the Italianos um, at seven and then the Chapines at eight for some dessert. So it'll be a very nice evening of just, um, being able to connect with one another as well as to just enjoy some nice um, holiday refreshments and some games. So uh, sign up for that just to let us know that you're coming. Invite a friend, a coworker. This is a great time to be able to draw them in and to um, just have a good time together as women. Um, just wanted to note also we've been announcing if you have not yet been water baptized and it's a desire for you to take this next step in your faith journey, we would love to champion you on and, and as you make that public confession of your faith. We will be having a water baptism uh, special celebration service on New Year's Day, which falls on a Sunday this year. Uh, there is uh, going to be a brief class after service about two weeks from now on December 11th. Um, so if you can help us just by either signing up online and letting us know if you or perhaps a child or a teenager of yours would like to be water baptized and there's also a sign up in the back in the foyer as well. Um, and then finally, uh, winter life groups will be starting mid-January. So we're putting all the plans together for that. That's a great way just as a, a, a way of discipleship and just growing together. We do life together, we say, in these groups. And it's just, a, it's been awesome. Every time that we've met for like a six-week session, we always hear such good nuggets, some good testimonies that come from that. So if that is um, a desire of yours to maybe open up your home for a life group or you have an idea for a life group and would love to facilitate that, please see me or there's also an online form just to let you, um, so you can just let us know some information about yourself and then we'll connect with you so that we'll have a menu of, of winter life groups uh, to offer uh, right after the holidays. So just a final reminder for uh, your tithes offerings today is Mission Sunday. That's where we emphasize our missions, faith, promise, giving. Um, a few weeks ago on our missions emphasis Sunday, we had these faith promise cards. If you haven't yet turned those in, we said take a few weeks, pray about it, ask God what he would um, challenge you to give over and above your tithe to give to our, our world missions and our local missions as well. Um, you could certainly see Dave Hearn for any information and uh, he's got cards for you too if you haven't yet received one. So God bless you. Thank you. At this time, we have a brief video and a uh, just a highlight of something that's coming up for families for kids um, that we did last year and we're hoping to do again with our harvest kids and then we'll have pastor andy come up thank you hey new jersey network kids ministry pastors directors leaders and parents we want to let you guys know about an exciting new jersey network event that is coming up 
Fun Arts. This event is open to first through fifth grade students who desire to use their gifts and talents to glorify God. Fun Arts is a day when students from the Assemblies of God churches all over New Jersey are able to display their various talents across a wide variety of categories and receive constructive feedback and encouragement from qualified coaches in their area of talent. Categories in which your child can participate include art, photography, writing, stories and poems, short sermon, spoken word, drama, dance, worship, singing, instruments, and more. There are both solo categories and group categories. Fun Arts is not a talent show. It is an opportunity to help students discover, develop, and deploy their gifts God has given them to devote their heart in worship to Him through those talents. For more information on specific categories, rules, or the event itself, you can visit njym.org slash funarts. We hope to see you there. Well, it's a joy to be with you today. Uh, my name is Andy Lynn. I help lead uh, in our state the kids and youth ministries and young adult ministries. So I, I spend a lot of my time speaking to middle schoolers and high schoolers. So it's always refreshing to be with adults. I love middle schoolers and love them. Uh, but as I get older, I have to, uh, it actually takes for me a lot more preparation to actually take a Bible passage and make it to where a sixth grader can like comprehend it and understand it. So it's always, I get really excited whenever I can talk to adults. So if you see me go a little crazy, just give me some grace. I'm usually in front of kids. It'll be all right. Uh, we're starting a new series though. Uh, it's called Christmas Is. And uh, every week for the next few weeks, you're going to hear a different look at what Christmas is all about. And today, I'm excited to talk to you about Christmas is what we are made for. Christmas is what we are made for. And uh, I don't mean the holiday. I don't mean Santa and the presents. I mean the actual word uh, Christmas or Christmas literally just means the celebration of Christ. Now, if you were go into our malls, into Home Depot, into Walmart or Target, you wouldn't think it's always the celebration of Christ. You'd think it's about holly and presents and cookies and all of these things. And none of those things are bad, but the original celebration of Christmas was about recognizing the importance of one figure, Jesus Christ, in our history. And I'm going to read you a few scripture references, but I hope today, before you leave, you can understand that Christmas is literally what you and I were made for. The first passage I want to go over with you is Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, and you'll see below it John 1, 14. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel means God with us. We sang the, uh, the song today, the beautiful song. The band did a great job with it, Here in Your Presence. Just this idea that God is with us. We were meant for the presence of God. And that's in Isaiah, which is really cool because that's hundreds and hundreds of years before Christ would be born in Bethlehem. And this prophet is saying, hey, it's going to be a virgin. And he's, his name's Emmanuel because he's literally God incarnate. God, and for those of you, incarnate can be this funky word. Uh, if you're at a Spanish restaurant and you see like chili con carne, you know, with meat, incarnation literally just means it put on meat, like spirit put on flesh. Uh, when I talk to students about this, I say that Jesus is a spirit wearing a human meat suit, and they all go, gross, that's disgusting. I'm like, well, that's, that's what it's about, though. It's the idea that the internal spirit puts on flesh. John 1.14 says, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. So here you have... John, one of the apostles, talking about the word, the spirit, the truth, became flesh incarnate and made his dwelling with us. And you're going to see all throughout the scriptures, Old Testament, New Testament, there's this theme that keeps popping up that about God wants to dwell with us. You can't escape it. 
It's in the Psalms. It's in the Old Testament. It's in the very beginning in Genesis. Just think about this with me. God creates Adam and Eve in the garden. Here's a little Bible quiz. What's the first thing that Adam does after he's created? A little Bible trivia. What's the first thing he does? Everybody says names the animals. But when you read it, when man is created, the first thing he does is on the seventh day, he rests with God. It's the first thing man does. The first thing man does is Sabbath with the Lord. He just is with God. What's really interesting is man then works from rest. He doesn't rest from his work. And nowadays, what, what, what do we do? We work really, really hard and we take a rest from it. How did God create us? He created us. The first thing Adam does is rest. And then Adam does work the garden. He names animals, but he does it from a place of rest. And so the way God set it up is every work week is working from rest, not working for rest, right? That's how God began it. And he made you and I to dwell with him. What is the purpose of humanity? To be with the Lord. There's a purpose in the garden and you and I chose, or I should say Adam chose, and therefore you and I chose not that life to be in the garden, but a different path. So now the rest of scripture, the rest of the stories of the Bible is how do we get that back? How do we get dwelling with God back? Now, a lot of people think that God punished us in the garden when we sinned, when Adam and Eve sinned, that we were punished, but it was really an act of grace. So when, when we took and ate of this, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, we had two choices, eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And if you're new to the church, I'll give you just a, a quick background on this. Adam and Eve are in the garden. The Bible tells us there's two trees in the middle of the garden. One is the tree of life. As you eat from it, it's eternal life. One is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, where you get to decide what's good and what's evil. And if you look around our world today, it's very clear to see which tree we ate from. Mankind wants to decide what's good and what's evil. And the Bible defines true wisdom as laying down the right to define what's good and evil and trusting in God's version. But Adam and Eve choose to eat the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which means forevermore, we are, God kicks them out of the garden so that they do not partake of the tree of life so that there's a chance for restoration. So he kicks them out of the garden. A lot of people think God can't be around sin. And that's not really true because that sounds limiting. What's true is what does a holy God do to things that are sinful? He destroys it. Not because of anger, because of pure holiness and pure glory. As we look through the Bible, God always warns people about his true full glory. God always warns people about his holiness, not in a way of punishment, but when we are sinful creatures in the presence of a holy God, a lot of people say, why doesn't God do away with all the sin in the world? Well, he could, but do you know what he'd have to do to get rid of the sin in the world? Get rid of the carriers of the sin of the world. So thankfully, God is going to send us what we really need. So I'm going to go over, before we jump in our passage, our passage today is going to be in John chapter 11. You can go ahead and turn there in your paper Bibles uh, or digital Bibles on your uh, devices. Um, before we turn there, I just want to ask you a few questions. How does God love you? Personally, I don't mean like biblically necessarily or like overall, but how do you feel loved by God? Is it when he meets your finances? Is it a still presence when you spend time in the word? Um, is it a few memories at an altar? Is it singing worship songs? Is it when, you know, just think about it. What does it, how do you receive the love of the Lord? If you could put up that slide for me of the five love languages, I do some premarital counseling and um, a lot of the couples, I always walk through the five love languages with them. Has anybody ever read about that or studied the five love languages, right? So just basically what it is, it was a study done by several doctors who decided that most human beings experience love through these five ways, words of affirmation, gifts, acts of service, quality time, and physical touch. So for some of you, you feel really loved when someone compliments you or says, I love you. That's words of affirmation. For some of you, when you receive a gift, it doesn't matter how much it is, but you just feel love when you get a gift. For some of you, when someone does something for you that they don't have to do, you feel loved. 
For some of you, it's quality time, and for some of you, it's physical touch, a hug, et cetera. Now, what happens to most couples um, that I work with, uh, especially in premarital, uh, and, and after they've been married for several years, they say things like, he or she just doesn't love me anymore. And when I talk with them, this is what ends up happening nine times out of 10, the guy is like, what do you mean I, I don't love you? I, I work hard for you, I clean out the cars, I take stuff where you need to go. And then she goes, yeah, but you never say that you love me. So what he's saying is, I'm trying to love you through acts of service. And she's like, I want to be loved through words of affirmation. So sometimes a lot of my counseling is just helping couples realize you actually do love each other. You just have to pause for a second and realize that how they receive love, how you receive love, and how each of you give love are different. And so both couples have to be flexible and try to love each other through each other's languages, but also that. So here, here's my, my question. What is God's love language to you this Christmas? How does God say, I love you to you this Christmas? Now, I want to encourage you that it's not on this list. Um, and I'm going to encourage you that when we don't understand God's love language, we ask questions like, why doesn't God do something about that? Why doesn't God stop this disease from affecting a family member? It's real. Why doesn't God save my nephew who has been on drugs for years? Why doesn't God help my finances? I work so hard, right? Whatever, whatever the line is, if we don't understand God's love language, we start wondering why God isn't more active. Why doesn't God, why does God allow a famine to happen over here? Why is God allowing this war? And we say things like that, and it's the sign that you and I don't understand his love language. So I'm, I'm gonna jump in. We're gonna be in John chapter 11. I'm just gonna pray real fast over the passage. Lord, I just thank you for the people of Harvest today. God, as we read your word verse by verse, I pray that we'd feel so loved by you. That God, that we would, we would feel fulfilled today, that we would realize we were created for this, that Christmas, that your gift for us. God, I, I pray that we would sense your words speak to us, jump off the pages, off the screens, and into our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. So John chapter 11, verse 1, it says, Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So his sisters went out to him saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now, in verse 5, he says something again, which is kind of interesting. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. You ever have somebody repeat something to you twice just to, like, prove a point, right? So here, the author, John, says, hey, Jesus loves like, Jesus loves this guy. Jesus loves him. And he says it twice. In five verses, it reiterates that Jesus loves this family and loves Lazarus. Not, not because it just is, is repetitive, because what's about to happen is going to make it seem like Jesus doesn't love them. As we keep going, in verse 6, it says, So when Jesus heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place that he was. In other words, Jesus loves them. So therefore, he does nothing. Just think about this. So, so Jesus hears from a messenger. And just to be clear, how we, they didn't have cell phones, obviously. No, no way to message people. So Jesus is, and his disciples are hanging out over here. Mary and Martha are a couple days journey over here. And they send a messenger to go find Jesus and say to Jesus, Hey, Jesus, the one whom you love is ill. Notice, they don't even have to say his name because they're best buds. So... He sends the messenger. The messenger comes and says, Jesus, the one whom you love is ill. And Jesus says, oh, don't worry. This illness won't end in death. It'll be for my glory. So the messenger goes back to Mary and Martha and says, don't worry. It's not going to end in death. Jesus says it'll be fine. And then when Jesus hears about it, it says he loves them. So he does nothing. How does... A loving father, or let's even bring it back. How, this is his best friend. 
And we know, if you know the story, Lazarus is going to die in this time period. So the messenger gets back, and just to be clear, Lazarus was actually sick. Lazarus actually suffered. Mary and Martha are actually mourning. And Jesus is over here doing nothing but hanging out with his disciples. And Jesus, remind you at this point, can literally snap his fingers, say the words. Jesus can heal people from afar. Jesus does not have to be physically with them. But he chooses to allow the person who he possibly loves the most on earth as a human to suffer and die. Just think about that. We know the end of the story, so it makes it sound like everything's okay. But in the moment, if you're Mary or Martha, what are you thinking? How many of you have some choice words for Jesus if you're Mary or Martha, right? They have seen Jesus say words and heal people from afar. And I, I, if I was them, I'm probably thinking like, man, I thought we were really close. I, mean, I know Jesus is, loves everybody, but I thought we were close. Like, why wouldn't he just say the words? Jesus has all authority. Why wouldn't he just do it? Why wouldn't he just heal? In verse 11, it says, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep. This is Jesus talking. But I go to awaken him. And the disciples are like, Jesus, if he's fallen asleep, he's going to recover. And Jesus had actually spoken of his death. The disciples thought he was just sick and getting better. But they thought he was resting. In verse 14, Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died, and for your sake I am glad. I rejoice that I was not there, so that you may believe, but let us go to him. <laughs> just think about it for a second. If you're the disciples, and you're like, this is Jesus' best friend. And he just said, for your sake, I'm glad. If I was a disciple, I would literally be like, man, if we get sick, we are so screwed. Like, Jesus was really close to John. Like, they were tight. Jesus is going to let John die. Like, guys, this is so weird. I, it seems a little crazy the way Jesus is talking. Jesus is rejoicing that his best friend suffered and died so that people could experience his glory. Now, glory is a, it sounds like a really biblical word. Glory means the truth about something, the truth about someone. So, for example, if I'm going to experience God's glory, I'm going to realize who he actually is. If I'm going to experience the glory of your basketball skills, I'm going to get schooled by you and realize the glory of your basketball skills. If I'm going to experience the glory of your cooking, I'm going to sit down at a meal and experience the truth about what your cooking is. Jesus is saying here, the disciples, even Mary and Martha and Lazarus, don't get who he really is. And they need to experience his glory. Now, in verse 17, it says, Now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been dead for four days. So Jesus and his disciples make the journey, a couple days journey. They had already waited a couple days. So by the time he gets back, Lazarus is died. And most scholars think, the timing-wise, by the time the messenger had gotten back, that Lazarus had already died. So just think about that. If Lazarus has already died, the messenger comes back and is like, don't worry, Jesus said it won't end in death. And they're like, Lazarus has already died. He's already gone. And so when Jesus has come back, now there was a Jewish superstition that said someone could get healed after three days. But they said nobody could be healed after four days, mainly because the body goes through a biological process. I'm not going to gross you out this morning, but it, it goes to a, a different level of decomposition that's hard to come back from, according to Jewish superstition. So Jew, uh, Jesus is proving a point here that it's not medicinal, it's not a healing, that it's a miracle, that he can create something out of nothing. That's what Jesus is going to prove here. And it says, just to be clear, Lazarus really died, Mary and Martha suffered, and they were disappointed with Jesus. They thought he didn't care. In verse 18, uh, it says, Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, but Mary remained seated in the house. Now, who would normally run to Jesus? Mary. She's mad. I can say that just in my own opinion, but I'm pretty sure I'm right. In verse 21, Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha said, 
I know, I know. He's going to rise again in the last day in the resurrection. And so here, Martha gets it a little bit. Martha knows that one day Jesus will restore everything and bring them to heaven. That, that's, what, that's where Martha's at. Martha does not realize that Jesus has the power right now that he is the life. He's not just a ticket to heaven, that he's so much more than that. Sometimes in our Christian walks, we can put Jesus and the gospel in this box. That is, he is my ticket to heaven, my avoidance of hell. And while there's a little bit of truth in that, we'd miss the fullness of who he is. And this is where Martha's at. Martha's like, I know, I know, one day you're going to come back and resurrect us. And Jesus is like, no, 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 you don't get it. And he's going to say right here um, in verse 25, what he's going to say is, uh, uh, let me just pause there for a second. Let me, let me go back to my, uh, my story about love languages. So uh, my first year of marriage, uh, no one had sh taught me about love languages. Um, no one had showed me anything. And uh, my love language is touch um, and words of affirmation. Uh, my wife's is gifts, but I had no idea of that at the time. And uh, I had gotten her a couple gifts for Christmas, but my wife had watched me the entire year and taken notes and got me all the little things that I wanted. She had saved up like privately. And so at Christmas morning, she was so excited. She gave me all these very meaningful gifts and I opened them all. I liked them and it, we, you know, we, we, it was awesome. But the next week I realized I didn't really need any of them. So I returned them all to the store. Right, I returned the Target and I got some gloves that I, I thought I needed and things. And so that the next night goes by and she goes, hey, let's play that board game we got. And I was like, I returned it. Oh, do you wanna watch that DVD that I got you? I returned that too. And uh, quickly she realized I returned all of them. And my, how, my, my apartment suddenly got pretty cold. <laughs> and uh, uh, obviously I didn't know then that her love language was gifts. So we ended up talking about it and she was upset that I returned her gifts. I said. I said, babe, I care about being with you, I care about putting my arm around you, who cares about gifts? Well, that was my first introduction to realizing that even if my wife doesn't put her arm around me or if my wife doesn't love me the way I want to be loved, that I can watch and see how, see how she's still loving me. And here, it, Jesus is going to illustrate this, and this is what I want to encourage you with our first big point today. God loves us by giving us what we need the most. God loves us by giving us what we need the most. The question is, what, what do you think you need the most? So a lot of us, if I were to answer this, ask this question to a group of students, they'd be honest and they would say a girlfriend or boyfriend. Uh, they would say, you know, finances. Uh, they, they would say something, you know, a business or whatever they're thinking about. Some, some, some people would say a healing. Some people would say, what do I need the most is that perfect job. Jesus here in verse 25 turns to Martha and he says, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She's still not quite getting it. She says, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the son of God, who's coming into the world. Today, you might think your biggest need is a relationship, money, physical healing, a better future, not being alone or afraid. And those are needs. And just to be clear, Jesus cares about those. He doesn't not care about those, but that's not your biggest need. When Jesus saw the disciples and Mary and Martha, the reason he said, I rejoice that he died is because Jesus now has a window to give them their biggest need. Experiencing the presence and the glory of God through Jesus Christ is you and I's biggest need on this earth. There's nothing we need more. Now, here's the tough part. Let's have an honest moment. Does it feel like that's your biggest need? You don't have to answer that because sometimes it doesn't feel like that's my biggest need. Just like Mary and Martha and Lazarus. I love that the Bible is full of these stories of humans being humans because I can intellectually tell you through the Bible, Jesus is my biggest need. But sometimes I think my biggest need is to finish a work project, to have my daughter understand something. To, to have a better marriage. Sometimes I, I would think my biggest need is not Jesus, but here Jesus is trying to prove to people and help them understand they were created, you, me, we were created to be in the presence of God. 
what we need is his presence. We don't need one more thing. We don't need more finances. We don't even need a loved one to come back from the dead. Although those things are great, those things would be great to have relationships. What we need most is Jesus Christ. And I, I want to encourage you before we keep reading, if you're like me, and there's parts of my life where I don't feel like he's my biggest need. This is a really tough prayer to pray. But if you say, Jesus, will you help me desire you more? Jesus, will you help me realize that you're my biggest need? We spend so much time in our culture, in media, and it's so easy to be trained and tricked that we have other needs that outrank Christ. But I assure you, we don't. When I, I look at my, um, I have a ten, uh, almost 10 year old, uh, a seven year old, and I have a one year old. And my 10 year old and seven year old, if I listened to what they thought their biggest need was, they would definitely have a unicorn. I'd have to find a way to build a unicorn or put a horn on a horse or something. Um, my, my middle child loves flamingos. Like it's, a, it's like if she could get a tattoo, she'd have a flamingo tattoo, but like, like she's crazy about them. Um, if it were up to her, we'd probably not have a home, but just have a yard with flamingos. Uh, imagine giving like a five-year-old a, a genie and giving him three wishes. Like the world would fall apart. You know, like, I wish everybody had a pony. And then every parent in America is like, what just happened? You know? Um, so thankfully, when we pray to God, God doesn't give us what we think we need. God doesn't give us what we think we want. God gives us what we actually need the most. Because as a loving father, if I gave my daughters what they wanted for dinner, it'd be bad. It would be bad. We'd probably be way more out of shape than we are. Instead, as a loving father, we try to give them vegetables and proteins and things like that. Now, do I occasionally want to bless them and give them what they want? Well, sure. But that's not every day, right? So as we keep going, verse 32. Now, when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, sounds like her sister, my brother would not have died. But when Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had also come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, where have you laid them? And they said, come, Lord, come and see. Now, just to be clear here, that word greatly troubled uh, means angry, usually. Not so much like some, some, some translations will say like deeply moved and sad. Uh, when you look at those phrases put together, I would argue that Jesus isn't so much sad here is as he is frustrated. This is Andy's interpretation, just to be clear. You can read this and interpret it for yourself. Um, the reason I say that is Jesus told the disciples, I rejoice that my, my, my best friend has died so that y'all can comprehend something, my glory. He goes over here. The other two people he's close to on earth, super tight with, Martha and Mary, don't get it and are mad at him. And Jews have come over to mourn. Now remember, Jesus can read all their thoughts and hearts, right? He's Jesus. So they are all murmuring. It's gonna, the, the scripture is going to tell us in a second. They're all going to murmur. Why wouldn't he do something? Wasn't he friends with them? Was it the man who healed the blind? Couldn't he have helped Lazarus out? Like, why, why isn't he doing something? Jesus is around the people he's closest with on earth and they don't understand what they actually need. Think about it. They want Jesus to do a parlor trick and heal someone. They don't realize what they need most on earth is standing in front of them. It's Jesus. They completely miss it. And Jesus says in verse 35, the shortest verse that we have about Christ, Jesus wept. Now, there's a lot of different commentators argue on this a lot. Some people say it's Jesus showing his humanity. Um, I would disagree with that just because the point of John, the whole gospel of John is about Jesus' divinity, not so much Jesus' humanity. Uh, Jesus' humanity is showcased in the gospel of Mark and Matthew. Uh, but in John, it, it kind of focuses in on that Jesus is divine. Um, also here, just looking at the context, it says he's greatly troubled, and I think he's weeping not for Lazarus, because Jesus knows he's about to heal Lazarus. Jesus knows that. I personally think he's weeping for the people who don't get it. 
I don't think he's moved because he's sad Lazarus died. He's the one who waited. Remember, Lazarus, Jesus could have been like, Lazarus is healed. Jesus is moved because his closest people didn't get it. Now, I, I would encourage all, if Jesus was here with us, would he weep for us the same way? That we miss, that what we need most is his presence. Hear, hear me on this. We don't need Jesus to redo our whole government and get new officials. It'd be great. It'd be awesome, trust me. I, we'd all like clap and cheer, but that's not our biggest need. It would be great if Jesus fixed all the injustices we have across the world with inequalities and all uh, famines and caste systems and, and gender inequality, all these things. It'd be great if, if, if we, he snapped his fingers, but that's not what you and I need the most. What you and I need the most is what we were created for in the garden to be in the presence of God, to be in his presence. Verse 36, so the Jews said, see how he loved him. Now remember, this is why a lot of people interpret Jesus as loving Lazarus so much. That's why he cried. But look who does that interpretation. It's this verse 36. The Jews say, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? All of the Jews there are thinking, why didn't he heal him? Because they need to realize that he is the son of God, that he is God incarnate, and he is what they need. And it says in verse 38, then Jesus deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, I love it. She's very practical, a homemaker, says to him, Lord, by this time there's going to be an odor. And for he has been dead four days, Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? In verse 41, so they took away the stone. Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. By the way, I love this whole prayer is literally just to prove that he is divine. It says, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I say this on the account of the people standing around me, that they may believe that you have sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips, and his face wrapped up with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. I always feel really sorry for Lazarus here, because my man comes out of the grave, and nobody wants to touch him. Everybody's like, I ain't touching that. Like, he smells. I, I wonder, this has nothing to do with the story. I always wonder, did he smell? Like, or did God, part of the healing, miraculous miracles, the smell was gone? I don't know. I just, stuff like that makes me curious. But here, at this scene, Jesus performs this miracle. And we, we find out, as you read John, this is one of the main miracles that people are like. He is the Son of God. He is God himself. He is the flesh that is not, he is the word become flesh that's dwelling among us. He is Emmanuel, God with us. Christmas is what you and I were meant for. It's what you and I were created for. You and I were created to be in the presence of Jesus. And Christmas is the beginning of that story where God chose his one and only son to take off his crown for us, which makes no sense makes no sense for him to take off his crown for us, for him to come off his heavenly throne and into a manger and to be the meek, not just a meek human being as a baby, but even bigger into a, a slave family, into a woman named Mary, who people don't think about it like this as a, at this, at this point, the Israelites, the Jews are all in slavery to the Romans. And, but the, the Israelites, the, the Jewish people still um, operate in their systems with the Romans above them. And uh, what's crazy is Mary here is, is pregnant outside of marriage. She's a virgin. Now, what's crazy is, again, most scholars would argue that, and, and if you've ever been to the Middle East, they're the most hospitable people I've ever seen in my life. I've walked through a village in the Middle East before, and they've invited me in for dinner, have no idea who I am. That's just who they are. So the idea that a pregnant woman would not get ushered into a Jewish town, at least into somebody's family room to have a baby is weird, unless she was being shamed and shunned because she was pregnant out of wedlock. 
So it just doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. Why would God do this? Because when God looks down at his people, at you and me, he sees our biggest need as us experiencing his presence. Our biggest need is not something he can do for us. It's him. And I want to end by reading this psalm. Um, It's the shortest psalm, so don't don't worry. It's three three verses. That's it. Uh, Psalm 131. It says this, O oh Lord, this is King David. They believe this is the last psalm he writes, the very last one. He's an old man, kind of on his deathbed. And he says, O oh Lord, my heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things that are too great or too marvelous for me. But I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child is my soul within me. O oh Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. When that, the verse I want to talk to you about as I close is this right here. But I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with his mother. My youngest uh, son, it, it, my youngest child is, is my son Ezra. Ezra just turned one. And I watched him this year in the weaning process, switching from breastfeeding to bottle feeding. And it's kind of interesting. Before, when he's with my wife, every time he's with my wife, it's, he's hungry and he views my wife as a little bit of a meal ticket. So he's with my wife, and it's instant, like, I want to eat. And uh, it, was a, it was an interesting process getting him weaned off. But once he was weaned off, it was really interesting. Now he wants to be with my wife, not because she's his process to get food, because it's his mom. And he puts his arms around her. And it's this switch with a weaned child. They no longer look at their mom for what they can give them. They just want their presence. And David here is saying, I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with his mother, like a weaned, like a, my, like a weaned child is my soul within me. I rewrote this psalm just for fun and the opposite, because this is more me than, than David. Self, my heart is proud. I'm thinking about myself all the time. My eyes are proud or haughty, and I chase after things too great or too difficult for me. So, of course, I'm noisy and I'm restless inside. It comes naturally like a hungry infant fussing on his mother's lap. Like a hungry infant, I'm restless with my demands and worries. I scatter my hopes and worries onto anything and everybody all the time. It's the opposite of Psalm 131. My challenge, if you put up that last slide for me, my challenge is really simple today. Is it okay, Andrea, if we end with the song? Is it all right? Can we do that in your presence? It was so beautiful. If you don't mind, that'd be great. I probably should have told you that before. Thanks, guys. Christmas is what we are made for. Jesus loves us by giving us what we need the most, and we need his presence more than anything. Now, I, I just want to encourage you. I, just this week, I heard some news from my family that was really tough to swallow. Just my, my family has been trapped in some sinful behaviors for decades, and I feel like stuff just keeps coming out. I don't know if any of your families have some of those histories, but mine has some rough histories and some illnesses that just don't seem to give up. And uh, I caught my, my prayer life this week being very much aimed at myself and my own situations. But, but just to encourage you, our Heavenly Father cares about those. He cares about your relatives that are ill, He cares about your relatives that are far from God. And so I don't want to belittle those things because in my own life, they're a big deal. But I think what helps us put those things in the right perspective is when we realize that God's love for us started and was shown from the beginning of time, but like personified in the person of Christ. As we just, as we literally strayed so far from what he wanted, he gives us Jesus so if you're ever wondering, does, does God really love me? Does Jesus really love me? You don't have to wonder because the answer is yes. He gave you what you need most, which is his son. And what I love about the story of Martha and Lazarus, he still heals Lazarus. And so he still values them. He values their emotions. God values your emotions and your journey. But what helps us get the biggest perspective, and we know when, when Jesus is crucified and he raises again that his people go through a lot of trials we we have that in history books and in the bible and the disciples would get martyred 
And you, you look at all of these things, and a lot of people would say like, did he not love them? Couldn't he have saved them from that journey, from that issue? What you and I need most is his presence. And the way that we can journey through anything that this life throws at us is when we're like an infant on its mom's lap. Not trying to get his mom to do something for us, but just enjoying his presence. I'm gonna say a prayer over you and we'll sing this song to close out. But I would encourage you to say a simple prayer today, just to say, Jesus, help me experience your presence. Jesus, I don't feel like your presence is my biggest need. Can you help my heart understand that? Can you help my heart enjoy that? Can you help my heart be fulfilled by that? That's been my prayer this week. I've been upset about some stuff in my own life, in my own family's lives. But my prayer has been, Lord, help me to get the right perspective. Lord, help me to view them as you view them. Lord, help me to be fulfilled by your presence and your presence alone. God, I thank you for the people of Harvest Church. God, I pray that we could understand that Jesus is what we need, that he is the resurrection, that he is the life, not one day, that God, he can be our life today that he can be all we need today. God, would we leave this place fulfilled and excited because we have what we need most. We don't strive in this life to get what we need, but Father, you've already provided it. Jesus, help us to enjoy the presence of your son, Jesus. God, help us to experience his presence. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with me today? Would you stand, we're gonna end with this song today. And as you sing it, I would encourage you not just to say the words, but say it right from your heart.